Welcome to Civil Disagreement, Responding to the Climate Change Crisis. Uh, my name is Nyan Hoshe. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School and a longtime community member of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. I currently serve as the faculty co-director of the Center's Rapid Response Impact Initiatives. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to our discussion today. In 2019, uh, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University started a new series of moderated discussions. Um, we call the Civil Disagreement Series. And the idea behind these moderated conversations was to bring together policy and subject experts from different political viewpoints to discuss an urgent current events topic. And the goal was to model thoughtful, reflective engagement on hard issues with the firm belief that we have much to learn from opposing perspectives. Today's entry in the series is responding to the climate change crisis. And it's sponsored by the Edmund J. Taffer Center for Ethics in collaboration with Harvard University's Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging through their community dialogue series, which shares the same aims as ours. And we'll discuss how we, individuals, the US and humanity should attend to the crisis facing our planet. And the aim of the conversation is to better understand the panelists' different strategies to act on climate change and also not just the strategies, but the beliefs and values that animate their positions. In addition, we'd like to extend a special welcome to our Intercollegiate Civil Disagreement Partnership Fellows. These are part fellows participating from the California State University in Bakersfield, uh, Harvard University, Santa Fe College in Gainesville, Florida, Stanford University, and St. Philip's College in San Antonio, Texas. The Intercollegiate Civil Disagreement Partnership Program is committed to reducing polarization by training student leaders to facilitate connections among their peers across political differences. And so for the entire academic year, these fellows have been working together across their five campuses to practice having hard conversations and learning how to facilitate these discussions. So after the public portion of this event, uh, the Intercollegiate Civil Disagreement Partnership Fellows will be convening small group conversations on climate change for fellow undergraduates. And so if you're an undergraduate who's listening and interested in participating, you can still join uh, by emailing Emily Bromley, uh, whose email I think will go into the chat. It's ebromley at fas.harvard.edu uh, to indicate your interest um, in participating in one of these small group discussions. These conversations will begin at 4.45 p.m. and last one hour. Well, my colleague at Harvard Business School, Rebecca Henderson, will moderate today's conversation among our esteemed guests. Rebecca is the John and Natty MacArthur University professor, and she's done a great deal of work um, on the issue of sustainability and business innovation and how mission-driven firms might be able to help transform capitalism in ways that can address major systemic problems, including climate change and environmental degradation. And so with that, Rebecca, I open the floor to you. Inha, thank you very much. I really appreciate your kind introduction. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our panelists. We have four really outstanding, and may I say, totally cool panelists. Um, the, um, I, I'm not going to outline their bios in detail. They are all very distinguished. We will chat in a link to their bios on our website. But um, let me briefly introduce them. We have first Dr. Noel Bakhtian, who is the director of the Berkeley Lab Energy Storage Facility. She is um, a member of the American Academy of Sciences and has a deep background in policy analysis, uh, having worked not only as senior policy advisor to uh, the last US, to the Obama administration White House, but also in the US Department of Energy, where she, um, amongst other projects, um, directed the US China Committee Clean Energy, uh, have an abbreviation, Residential Center. <laughs> My apologies, Noel but a very distinguished background in energy policy and, and practice. Uh, we have um, Dr. Franz, uh, I'm sorry, Ambassador Francis Rooney, um, 
who was not only ambassador to the Holy See under President Bush, but also represented the 19th District of Florida in 2017 and 20, between 2017 and 2021, when he was Republican co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus and one of two Republicans to introduce a carbon tax bill in the 116th Congress. So uh, Dr. Bakhtin and Ambassador Rooney, welcome to our conversation. Um, in a moment, I will introduce our other two panelists, but let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to run this conversation. Uh, we're going to begin by having two uh, our discussants talk to each other. So first we're going to go with Noel and Francis and I will try and trigger a rich conversation between them. And then I will move to Benji and Julie and our other two panelists um, and try and trigger a rich conversation between them. And then we will go to the full panel talking to each other. And my hope is that you will have questions for the full panel. So please use the Q&A function, uh, type in your questions, and we will try and introduce them into the conversation. Uh, so in a moment, I will uh, kick off the conversation between Noel and Francis. Let me tell you a little bit about our other two panelists who are equally distinguished. Uh, Benji Backer is an entrepreneur and political activist from Seattle. He is the president and founder of the American Conservation Coalition, which is the country's largest market-based environmental organization dedicated to mobilizing young people around environmental action, but through a more market-based limited government perspective. Um, he serves on a number of boards and he has been on so many lists of cool people under 30 that I'm not going to list any of them. Just go have a look at his bio. It's very, very cool. Uh, Julian Brave Noisecat is, Julian is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, you're a journalist, you do policy, you do research, you do art, you do activism, you do advocacy. Uh, Julian is the Vice President of Policy and Strategy with Data for Progress, which is a think tank. He's the Narrative Change Director at the Natural History Museum, an artist and activist collection. And he's a fellow at uh, the Type Media Center, the NDN Collective, and the Center for Humans and Nature. And he writes regular columns for uh, two major publications. So I'm wondering when you sleep, Julian. <laughs> that is a pretty amazing list. So. Our thanks to all our panelists. We really appreciate your, your being here. Um, Ambassador Rooney, Francis, could I ask you to go first? Sure. Could you please tell us a little bit about what you think the <clears throat> real solutions to climate change are? If, if you were in charge, you had the magic wand, what would you do? Yeah, if, if you posit that the, the ultimate boogaboo is CO2 in the atmosphere that has caused a lot of downstream effects, and you agree that those downstream effects relate to CO2 in the atmosphere, then you got to go back to a few really pretty simple measures. I mean, I, I think the carbon tax is uh, to talk about. It's market centric. It doesn't require hiring any bureaucrats or a new government agency like what they have in Europe. And you let the market solve it for you and it'll hasten the demise of coal. Coal's going away anyway, so why pollute the atmosphere for the next 10 years when we can just go ahead and take it off the table? And if you combine the carbon tax with incentives to deploy the best carbon sequestration and capture technologies, then you can take natural gas from being seven times as clean as coal to being maybe, uh, Benji probably knows exactly, 12 to 15 times. And those technologies are there. We just have to stimulate people to use them. The majors are more than glad to use them, but we got to get it where all the energy industry uses them. And it's always the little companies that don't want to do what the big companies are willing to do. That's why the majors have come out for carbon tax right away. But the API and a lot of the people that represent smaller energy producers have been a little behind the curve. Fortunately, just last week, uh, Mike Summers with API uh, changed their policy and they came out to support it. You know, I'm involved with the Alliance for Market Solutions, which is over 100 uh, Fortune 500 CEOs who are all behind the carbon tax. It's the best way to take a lot of carbon out of the system and use 
and and then okay, one of the negatives about the carbon tax is so is um, Francis, before you go on, could you just take thirty seconds for those who aren't as deep in this conversation as as we are? Like, what is a carbon tax? Okay, and what, what a carbon tax would practice? do is yeah. it imposes a tax on carbon. So the more carbon centric your product is, the more tax you pay. So coal is going to pay seven to eight times as much per cubic foot, square inch, whatever measurement you deploy uh, than natural gas will. Gasoline or uh, oil would pay a little more than natural gas as well. And so you take that, you, so you basically use the market to disincentivize the use of certain fuels. It makes them that much more expensive. And I'm sorry, you were saying that 500 CEOs have signed on to this solution. Oh yeah. And so because it's a market centric solution and there will be so much money which Benji knows exactly how much I forget. You know, my bill, I knew when I did my bill, but I think it's a couple of billion, several billion dollars, but there will be enough money to use some for economic redevelopment and job retraining in the coal areas. And so think about what we're doing. We're letting the energy industry pay to retrain people whose coal jobs have been lost instead of us taxpayers having to do it because the coal jobs are gonna be lost anyway. It just may be 10 years from now instead of now. The other thing is there would be plenty of money to help average American people, disadvantaged people, deal with a five to 15 cent rise in the price of gas. People say the carbon tax is at, lacks equity because gas will go up a little bit. Yeah, but it won't go up that much. And it'll go up less than the regional differences in the price of gas between different states. But if you have all this money to distribute to people, uh, that will ameliorate that adverse effect. So, so that's the first thing I would do is a carbon tax. Okay. And is there a second thing? Oh, yeah. First, <laughs> and the second thing I would do is reverse Donald Trump's uh, policy of letting Bolsonaro get away with burning up the Amazon. It's the largest carbon sink in the world. And I don't care how many trees we try to plant, you can't offset burning up the Amazon. And the radical, uh, and many of you probably know the radical impacts of that better than I do as scientists and, and professionals, but the, the, and I've been all through the Amazon. The, the impact of turning the Amazon into just a clay field uh, is, is, a, is terrible for what it would do to rainfall and the carbon sink. And, and hopefully that um, Secretary Blinken, and I know President Biden feels differently about it, are going to take a harder line with Brazil on that, both carrot and sticks. Remember, we tried back with the Brady bonds, back when H.W. Bush was president, and, and to get them to stop burning up the Amazon. That would be the second thing I would do. The other thing, there's a few smaller things, you know, there's the low, low sulfur bunkers. Let, let, the, let's leave the smaller things, I think. Okay, and, uh, those would be the two main things. Okay, that is so obviously the move to electric vehicles, uh, fueled by electric power plants, not burning coal. So you, you sound so passionate and so clear on these points. Could, could I ask you a little bit about where your passion comes from? And Forgive me, but this can't have been like a fabulously popular position in the Republican Party when you introduced the bill. I mean, we know there were only two co-sponsors. It didn't pass. Could you talk a little bit about what really gets you up in the morning about these issues? How you well, look, well, you I'm a lifelong CEO used to make database decisions. So when you read the information, there's no other conclusion to come to. The problem we have in the Congress is a lot of members and senators uh, have a skill of getting elected, but they don't necessarily have a skill of relying on data to make decisions. And so when you read the IPCC, you read the executive branch study, you read all the different things that Brookings and, and AEI, a conservative thing, everybody's published about, about these issues, you, you've got to come to the conclusion that we have a real problem with CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you're going, if you're going to be based on data, you got to do that. And so my goal with Republican leadership was to show them those figures and show them the polling of what people think in America, what young people think. Even right down here in this district I represented, which is R plus 16, that's super conservative. 70% of the people polled said, we think climate change is a serious problem and we need the government to help fix it. Yeah. So our Republican ideologues who aren't used to making database decisions to protect their company or the military to protect their bases, you know, the military is all in for this climate change stuff because they have a job to do, protect us. And, and, but these ideologues don't have to protect anybody, but all they gotta do is talk. And so we've gotta, we, we have to go around them to the people and continue to push the people 
to, to be hard on them when they won't take reasonable measures to deal with this. Thank you very much. Noelle, could you tell us a little bit about what your one number one and number two go-to solutions for climate change might be? Absolutely, thanks Rebecca. First, I just wanna say I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and I, as always, have to start with my ever-present disclaimers, the first being that the views here are my own, and I'm not speaking as a representative of uh, the National Lab or Department of Energy. And second, that my opinions are my opinions now. And if I'm doing this right, and I'm learning and listening to a diversity of opinions, my opinions will change in the future. Um, so, uh, like Francis mentioned, if we're starting with the common understanding on climate change that I think I'm paraphrasing Catherine Cahill that climate change is real, it's us and it's now. There's really three major areas of action that I think uh, I, I would say we need to focus on. One is the long-term bedrock. I would say we absolutely need to keep, keep a focus on funding for basic and applied science research and development in this country. The US is actually one of the few major economies whose public investments in R&D have declined as a percentage of GDP in the last 25 years. And these are really long-term investments that lead to knowledge, discovery, innovation. We have the computers today, inter internet today, modern medicine today, because of federal R&D dollars and investments in science. So to give a more specific example on the energy topic, um, the lithium ion battery industry has really taken off and tech prices have dropped to a point where we're seeing a revolution in the transportation sector. In fact, you've probably seen in the news how Ford, GM, BMW are all making recent commitments on electric vehicles, which is really exciting. But guess where all that tech started? It started in a science lab run by Professor, Professor Charles Tobias in the 1950s at Ber Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he basically invented lithium ion electrochemistry. And we still have brilliant researchers at the lab that are carrying on that le legacy, creating new battery materials for the future, literally atom by atom, using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to create new battery paradigms for our future. So the, my first point is that funding for basic and applied science can't flag. In fact, I think it needs to grow in areas to support climate change mitigation. Second one is the temporally, it's, it's the now. We need to be deploying. We need to be deploying now the technologies exist, uh, wind, solar, and others have been doing really great, but we haven't deployed enough. Uh, and that's just the power sector. As Francis mentioned, we need to be thinking about transportation. We need to be thinking about ag. We need to be thinking about the sources and the sinks for CO2. We need to be thinking about the industrial sector. So to me, carbon pricing is a no-brainer. We need a way to correct the market failure, which allows companies to price their products while hiding the true cost of society. Uh, and Rebecca, you're one of my favorite experts in this space, but just to explain to folks who might be new to this, there's uh, kind of two different outcomes, uh, negative outcomes um, here as far as hidden costs. One is there's hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, of, of, um, from pollution from these kinds of plants. And that has a huge effect on those people and their families and our healthcare system. But there's also this devastating long-term effect of climate change, droughts, wildfires, storms, and it's companies that are making decisions based on profit. That's the way our market works. Um, something that stuck with me a long time ago was, I think it comes from an indigenous framework, uh, a Native American framework that says the decisions you make today, you need to be thinking about the impact those will have on the next seven generations. And I think that's really important. And I think that's where um, carbon pricing comes in to help us do some of that. And then the third I just wanted to throw out there, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I feel strongly that communication and education of the public needs to be a big piece of this. Um, we've all seen during COVID what happens when the, the public isn't coming along with the science and the decisions that are being rolled out, and that can have a huge impact. So for, for energy and climate in particular, here's an example. We have this technology, if we're rolling it out, it's still incumbent on the customer to be buying the electric vehicle, to be turning off their lights, to be buying the the, the efficient appliances, et cetera. So I, I feel like we all need to be working together globally to be working more on communication and, and educating the public. Fantastic. So I'm hearing violent agreement around the idea of a carbon price, which is not so great if you're moderating you know, a discussion, but let me, let me try for a little bit of controversy here. So um, Francis, my guess is, and I don't want to speak for Julian and Benji, but certainly I'm I'm on the record as being all up for a, for a carbon price, so for a carbon tax. But let me push you just a little bit. Um, 
as Noel said, arguably we need significantly increased funding for fundamental research. And she didn't say this, but she kind of hinted that maybe sometime she might say, and we can't wait for a tax to do its job. There are some things we should simply get going and we need some big government. And, you know, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the carbon tax, but I think we need these other policies as well. Um, how, how would you react? Well, I would, I would agree with that in, in large part. I mean, I definitely think there's, a, as, as Noel said, there's a strong history of, of successful government research, both at DARPA and the different labs that have brought us to places we would not be, like the internet and a lot of other things. So uh, we shouldn't be cutting all that back. I mean, that's one of the saddest things about what's happened in the country is things like research and infrastructure have cut back while we don't seem to be able to pay for anything else. Um, and with that said, when you get into the research of the next generation of lithium ion batteries, the, bring the cost down for electric cars where the market can make that preference based on the market, which will happen if the costs come down enough, uh, then we're really starting to hit a, a real sweet spot with, with conversion to electric vehicles. Same like the technologies of sequestration and capture. The more we can uh, do that and turn natural gas into a safer fuel, because, and I know a lot of environmental people disagree with this, but we're gonna have natural gas for quite a while. There's just not enough solar and wind and tidal movement, et cetera, to get us to the finish line, especially with growing energy needs to fuel electric vehicles and technology. But that doesn't mean it has to, it can't be the cleanest natural gas we can get as we move to develop more solar, wind, tidal movement, and things like that. So that might be an area of disagreement, but maybe not. So Francis, I'm interested, um, because when you say we're, we're gonna need gas around for a long time, my belief is that there is enough, well, not deployed yet, solar and wind, but the way I see natural gas is kind of as a bridge to get us to the 100% to the, uh, clean, clean energy future. So is, is that your, the way you yeah, are? I agree with that. Oh, I just don't yeah. believe that you, I don't agree that you could say, okay, hard stop on carbon in 20 years or something. I think we have to deploy all the research and the things you're talking about to move towards that goal and agree on the goal. I hear you. I would say though, that something we need to keep in mind at the same time, is the, the time that we have to actually manage the temperature rise. Because I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a, a ecologist, yeah. but the oceans are heating up and I think it's already too late. We're already locked in with some of the ocean heating. That's gonna have huge effects on, on weather and all these other things. So oh, as long totally. as- Totally, we could, we could talk about that for a long time. It's, it's yeah, the consequences are clearly there. And, and I, I think I read something, maybe I'm wrong, maybe all, one of y'all can correct me, but that even if we do all the possible things we know about, we'll barely be able to meet the Paris goals. I, my impression is that that's uh, just based on current technology right now with no new policies or anything, mm -hmm. okay. is my understanding. By the way, maybe another wedge issue for us, Francis, to help Rebecca out is thinking about industry, government and industry's role in all this. And the way I've heard it, but I'd love to hear from you is um, that there might be drastic differences in um, understanding of where where the transition point should be from, you know, government, okay, does basic research and things industry doesn't want to do. But what I've been feeling more and more, especially as I'm standing up the center at, at Berkeley Lab, is that we need to be bridging the gap more between government and industry so we can actually be doing the handoff more successfully instead of trying to be very careful about, oh, that's industry space, they're going to pick up on it. So I was wondering if you could comment on your your feelings on that. Yeah, I think I think to be a little optimistic about it, and we certainly need all the optimism we come up with in this dire situation, uh, is that you're seeing a bit of a convergence with things like all these CEOs want to uh, talk about sequestration and lower carbon and more energy, more electric energy and carbon tax, et cetera. That's a convergence with the government, but the government's still got to set the goalposts. And the government's got to make the make the make the playing field such that the least scrupulous competitor has to play ball with the good competitors. And that's yeah. a real problem for me. And that was a real problem the last four years. I had that argument with with Wheeler at the at the uh, EPA, where he said in a hearing, he said to me, my job is not to protect the major oil companies who are for a carbon tax. My job is to protect the little guys. I said, no, your job is to defend the big oil companies who want to do the right thing and make the little guys do it too. I like that. So 
so so I have a wedge issue. <laughs> um, let me just try this out, okay? I'm not sure I believe it, but let me try it out on both of you. So I love a tax on carbon, but most people don't. It's super hard to get them passed. In France, they had to reverse it. In Australia, they had to reverse it. Even in British Columbia, where they sort of like the carbon tax, or in California, there's huge debate about whether it's at the level that will actually drive change. And some of the projections say you have to put a tax really quite high. So I think we should have a carbon tax, but, but let me just try this out on both of you. I kind of like the infrastructure bill that the Biden administration has advanced. You know, massive spending to deploy some of these technologies, drive them down the learning curve, really get things kick-started. We, we have so little time. So, so just, just for fun, let me try out on both of you. I want a massive public spending program as well. How do you feel? Well, first of all, on, on the carbon tax, it needs to be up around $50. There was a great article in Foreign Affairs just about three years ago to that point, proving up how big it needs to be to change the market. You're absolutely right. Uh, one of the reasons, that's also one of the reasons why the bill, I, one of the two bills I introduced would give the money back to the people so that it would offset the, the difficulty of people's uh, paying for their gas and also show them that while it's a tax, it's also a, a, a revenue for them, you know, and take some of the sting out of it. But um, um, because we've got to have it where it's acceptable to, to many people. And for me, Rebecca, I'd say um, deploy everything that we can feasibly, as fast as we can feasibly. And for me, I, I like to think about process a lot. That's why I've you know, been standing up centers here and there. I like structure and process. I'm an engineer. And so when I think about it, I just want to make sure, like Francis said, it's based on data um, and that and that it's based on diversity of thought. It's based on having the right uh, voices at the table, thinking about equity from the very beginning, um, but deploy as much as we can afford. I mean, obviously keeping our, our debt and, and everything else in mind, we, we have to be very smart about this. But part of it to me is thinking that we're actually uh, um, allaying costs that we would have down the road because of climate change. So taking that into account as well, the incredible cost to the government and, and our society of the, the more storms that we're gonna have, the wildfires that we're gonna have, et cetera, that, that we're gonna have to deal with. Thank Can you. I make two comments about that? That is really smart. Okay, Noel. Um, the infrastructure parts of the Biden plan, I really like a lot and I agree with you. Uh, Rebecca, I think that that we need to advance these technologies that can help. I think we need to have money in there for resiliency measures in, in low uh, low lying areas that are being plagued by sea level rise, like Miami Beach, New Jersey Shore, et cetera. And um, those are all real good. But the at the end of the day, we've got a bit of a PR problem here. And maybe I'm an optimist, but I think that to to Noel's point, if we could make the American people understand how dire the rise in the ocean heat content, the greater intensity of storms, how that's gonna affect them, how the sea level rise is gonna affect them. And it's not just gonna affect them if they live on the coast. Look at all the lobsters moving from Maine to Canada. Uh, look at the declining herring and cod populations off the Georgia's bank and in the Baltic, uh, Baltic Sea. I mean, the Baltic Sea at 81 degrees, it's like the Gulf of Mexico. And so these problems here that are being unleashed have huge consequences that we somehow have to ring the bell of the American people. Thank you very much. Let me trans uh, move to the second set of panelists, if that's okay. Really very much appreciate your uh, participation and, and the exciting conversation we just had. Um, Benji and Julian, let me call you to the panel. If uh, if I were you, I'd be kind of nervous simply because you're thinking, well, all the good arguments have uh, gone maybe. So what I'm hoping is that you will pick up on where our first two panelists uh, started. So a brief, like, what would you do and how does it differ if at all from what we heard in the first panel? But then I'm hoping we'll have some time to talk about and how would you get there? You know, how would you put in motion the kinds of changes that you, uh, that you think are necessary because, it's one thing for us to have meetings and design the perfect policy. 
the question of how one gets these implemented and builds support is, is I think huge. And I suspect you have very different views as to how to do that. So um, Julian, would you kick us off? What, what are your one or two go-to solutions? Well, firstly, Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. And it's a pleasure to be in conversation with Benji. Uh, we might not agree on much, but hopefully we can agree that uh, we're talking about a very real problem um, today in, in global climate change and the climate crisis. Um, so look, I think that to tackle climate change, it's uncontroversial to say that we have to uh, significantly transform uh, many sectors of our economy. Uh, in the energy sector, we have to transition from fossil fuels uh, to clean energy. In the transportation sector, we need to replace internal combustion engines with batteries. Uh, in the manufacturing sector, we have to uh, invent new technologies for heavy manufacturing or otherwise figure out ways to deploy technologies to capture emissions from that sector. Uh, in the agricultural sector, we have to learn how to better use our land, how to care for soil, uh, and also how to address the emissions uh, created by, by animals and, and cattle and things like that. Uh, in the building sector, we have to electrify everything. So my mother cooks on a gas stove. She does it really well. Um, but in the future, she's going to have to learn how to make a mean pie with a, a, an electric stove. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, it's worth beginning by acknowledging that free market capitalism is a very powerful engine of change. Uh, in saying that, I'm agreeing with um, folks like Karl Marx. You know, Marx acknowledged the power of capitalism to transform society and the world. Um, yet over the last 40 years, we have lived through uh, a period of uniquely unbridled uh, capitalism, not just here in the United States, but in much of, of the world. Uh, it's been a period of um, restrained government spending and intervention into the economy, a period of deregulation, uh, and a period of, of very low uh, taxes, particularly on corporations and the wealthy. Um, and if the free market was going to uh, solve uh, the climate problem alone, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, a, more, a better moment in history for it to have done that. Uh, and yet, uh, of course, uh, in the years since Dr. James Hansen uh, testified to Congress about the perils of the greenhouse gas effect, what was then more, popularly, uh, more popularly called the greenhouse effect, uh, humans have released more carbon into the atmosphere than in all prior history. Uh, in fact, um, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere uh, reached 412 parts per million in 2020. And the last time that happened, there were forests on Antarctica. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet did not yet exist and sea levels were more than 80 feet higher uh, than they are today. Um, our species, people we would identify as humans, as homo sapiens, uh, did not yet walk the earth. Uh, and for all those reasons, um, I think that we need significant policy changes. We need significant government intervention into the economy to bring about the transformations that we seek. Uh, President Biden last week uh, proposed a very ambitious American jobs plan that would invest $2 trillion uh, into the economy to address uh, climate change among a number of other structural challenges our economy faces. Uh, and I think that that's a good start. That's a down payment on the action that we need to see. Uh, and if anything, um, you know, there is compelling research that suggests that we actually should be investing more in the economy over the next 10 years. Um, a study from the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts and Amher Amherst uh, found that in order to move the economy to full employment, a goal that LBJ, FDR, and I believe Biden himself um, have, have pursued as, as significant democratic presidents, uh, we would have to invest $10 trillion or $1 trillion per year over the next 10 years. Um, so I think that uh, to tackle this problem, we're gonna need policy intervention, we're gonna need government intervention. Uh, and if anything, the, the, the plan that the president uh, has outlined uh, needs to get more ambitious. I think it's a great start, uh, but I think that we can actually do more. Thank you. Benji, what are your go-to one or two solutions? 
Well, first of all, like everyone else has said, thank you so much for, for having me here. It's, it's an absolute honor. And I think it you know, really speaks to the opportunity that we have on climate change to reach across ideological uh, lines to find some common sense solutions. I had the opportunity to testify a couple of years ago at Congress with Greta Thunberg and, and, and two other left of center activists. And I was the right of center activist. And ever since then, it's been, it's been a pleasure to participate in many cross ideological panels that have really showcased what the power is of this conversation, unlike other ones where we can come to that uh, same common ground that Julian so eloquently described where we are knowing the urgency of this crisis, that humans do play a huge role and that you know, we only have so much time to solve what is what is the current globe's biggest, biggest problem. So what are the one or two go-to solutions? So I'll take a very un, uh, probably, probably a fairly controversial answer here and say, I don't have one or two go-to solutions because I don't think that we should be focusing on one or two solutions to solve this crisis. I think we should be focusing on a whole set and swath of solutions. Uh, to Julian's point, you know, the infrastructure plan is just the beginning of what we need to do uh, in this country to solve climate change. And really what it comes down to is I think in this climate conversation, we've been too focused on the one or two solutions. We've been too focused on the Green New Deal or the carbon tax or whatever it is, uh, cap and trade. And we've been aiming for that. And that's been the goal. But along the way of having those policies as the goal, we've completely missed opportunities to start taking steps in the right direction. It wasn't until the end of 2020 uh, where Congress finally passed a bipartisan major climate investment, the biggest ever, that we actually got some progress. But over the last couple of decades, we haven't been able to make that progress because we've been so hung up over one or two solutions that we each individually think are very important. So as an individual and as an organization, you know, we think that there is an opportunity to start investing in steps in the right direction, whether that's infrastructural investments, investing in natural solutions to plant more trees and restore wetlands, as simple as that, uh, or it's it's focusing on technology and innovation. Uh, like Noel so eloquently talked about you know, the, the importance of R&D. We don't have all the solutions uh, to fight climate change yet. So investing in those technological solutions. So it's, it's, it's a mixture of, I think, a lot of steps in the right direction that I think we need to tackle. Last Congress, there were over 15 bipartisan climate bills. None of them were passed except for the one in December in a lame duck session. There is an opportunity to have had at least 15 additional climate policies passed if people could set their sights on the far out future as well as the short term future. And so my main message is let's focus on some actionable wins we can get under our belt, some actionable wins that can help boost the economy and uh, support fighting climate change at the same time. And I do think that the market and individual action plays a huge role in, in that. State action plays a huge role in that, as well as federal action. Uh, but I think we need some small wins as well as the big wins. So happy to dive in more, but I, I do think that even though that's not maybe the traditional answer that you might've expected, I do think it's important to note what we can accomplish while waiting for that perfect silver bolt solution that I personally don't think exists, but even if it does, let's make some progress before we get there. Fantastic. Um, Julian, can I push you a little bit? I, uh, I recently published a book called Reimagining Capitalism, shameless plug. Um, but the reason I mention it is I've been giving talks all over the country and you know in our Zoom world, all over the world, saying we need to reimagine capitalism. And many people look at me, particularly people under 35, and say, why reimagine capitalism? Why not just throw it out the window? And so my question to you is, why not just regulate the heck out of these companies? Give them a schedule by which they have to come off carbon. Just, you know, tell the, tell the economy we're moving off carbon. I mean, I, I hear you saying, yeah, the infrastructure plan, yeah, markets. But, but can I persuade you to be a little bit more radical? And if not, why not? I'm not sure I understand the provocation or the okay. question actually. So here's my question is, I think I understood you to say that you would be open to something like a tax on carbon, that you think the approach oh, of the Biden administration is a good approach, but the Biden administration is essentially subsidy. It's subsidy, it's carrots. There are no sticks, right? Well, that's not true though. 
Well, that's so my- there is it's a combination of carrots and sticks, right? And I think that um, the the Biden the American Jobs Plan, for example, for the energy sector. Let's just talk about the energy sector for a second. Um, includes a hundred billion dollars of appropriations uh, to address um, you know our energy system and to modernize it. it includes three hundred billion dollars of tax incentives. So this would be the ITC, PTC, uh, as well as tax incentives for transmission lines. And I think there's one other that I'm not remembering. But, but this is all uh, and then there's also, wait, hold on one second. Yeah. There's also a, a clean electricity standard that would move the country to 100% clean energy by uh, 2035. And that is a stick, right? So it's a combination of carrots and sticks. Um, and a clean electricity standard, you brought up the question of carbon taxes, is not a carbon tax. It's a, it's a a performance standard that would require every utility in the country to source all of its energy uh, from clean sources uh, on a schedule, this one being determined that we should be sourcing 100% of our energy from clean or net zero emission sources in 2035. So, so it's a combination of carrots and sticks to both incentivize the development of clean energy and clean industry, as well as the sticks to, to move us off of um, fossil fuels and dirty so energy thank and to bring emissions out of the system. And, and I, I apologize that I had um, overlooked the clean energy standard. Can I, could I persuade you to take a position to say that then we should be setting standards across a multitude of industries, construction, infrastructure, um, transportation, that those kinds of standards might be much more effective than a market mechanism? Um, I think I'm, you may have misheard my what I was saying. I was saying that uh, we should be using me mechanisms to incentivize uh, clean uh, markets and, and clean energy in the market as much as possible. So I think investments and incentives are really important. But you know, I am part of a, a I'm on the board of a group called Evergreen Action, which has been very much in favor of a standards investment and justice oriented approach yeah. to this problem. So that's um, why on I'm asking hand, you yes, this question. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that, I think we need yeah. I think we need stimulative policies, but we also certainly need performance standards. Uh, and I think in the energy and electricity se sector, I think that it's really important that we get that clean electricity standard. There's similarly going to be a push for uh, standards in uh, the uh, transportation sector, particularly with vehicles, et cetera. Um, and I, I would also agree that we need them for buildings and all sorts of other things there. So there's actually no, I don't think we have a disagreement here. Okay. Well, I was wondering, I, I actually wanted to pull out that, that no, you, you think that's, that, that's appropriate. Because now I want to ask Benji, like, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about a significant step up in the regulation of many of these sectors? I mean, we could have talked about agriculture. As Julian said, we need to transform agriculture. You know, I, I think there's definitely an argument for let's do it through regulation. Benjamin. I'm, I'm incredibly weary of that, uh, that approach. And, and I think, and there's two parts of that that I would like to, to, to hammer on. And the first is kind of, I had the opportunity to travel a country this past fall to two or 34 different states in an electric car and see what the different climate change, uh, basically different climate change ideas were happening in those communities. And the reality that I saw from low income communities to affluent areas, to urban areas, to rural areas, was that each area is dealing with this in a completely different way. And to completely rely on a federal regulation mandate program all the time is incredibly damaging to those local communities because those local communities have different energy sources, they have different landscapes, they have different ways of living lives and they have different cultures. And to pretend that the government can just kind of regulate our way out of this problem here in the United States, let alone the world, I think is incredibly flawed. We need solutions that work for everyone, not just what sounds good in Washington, DC. And, you know, as a young person, I think that approach has been tried for, for 20 years, and we haven't made a lot of substantial progress on climate change. The reality is we need to have the entire globe bought into this crisis. We need every single state in the United States to be bought into this crisis, and we need every single lo locality in those states to be bought in to this crisis. And so to rely on, on mandates only and, and, and really significantly ramp those up, I think is, is foolish. Now, is there a role for regulation and mandates in this conversation? Absolutely, but to, to mandate that everyone get on board with this exact specific objective by this specific date is completely 
you know, delaying opportunity because you're not going to get buy-in from those communities. Those policies aren't going to be able to be passed nor implemented. And there are certain parts of the country, I grew up in Wisconsin and I live in Seattle now, Seattle is almost completely powered by hydro. But a lot of the communities that are pushing for this 100% um, you know, clean by X date are not even wanting hydro. So they would even have to overhaul the entire economy, uh, energy economy, just to make uh, the state be powered. And that's not realistic in the time frame that they're talking about. Now, if you open up energy sources to natural gas, understanding that natural gas is going to be a part of at least the near-term future, uh, like Ambassador Rooney was talking about, or nuclear energy or hydropower, then I think you have a more realistic conversation. But still, I think it, it dilutes the importance of the buy-in of these local communities. And then secondarily, uh, I do believe that we should reimagine capitalism. I, I agree with you that we should reimagine capitalism because I think capitalism is the most powerful uh, way to change things quickly. Of course, capitalism is part of the reason that we are where we are, and I completely understand that. Uh, but those capitalist tendencies are a reason why I'm able to talk to you over Zoom today and we're able to have this conversation, and, and that's very cool. But let's use capitalism for uh, a greener future, for a cleaner future. As a consumer, I have a voice with my dollars. As a voter, I have a, vo I have a voice with my vote. And let's use not only the political power, but the economic power of being an individual uh, in this economy economy to have a, gr a good balance between what the government can do and what the economy can do. But if you allow companies to innovate and you allow consumers and, their, and the staff of those companies to make those decisions, you yield good results. Now, the last thing I'll mention here is that the, the, the top 10 most economically free countries in the world have some of the best track records for reducing emissions over the past decade. That wasn't the case you know, 20 or 30 years ago, but now that the market is moving that way, those are the countries that are reducing emissions the most. The United States is reducing emissions more than any other country in the world. We need to do a lot more, but that does show that the power of capitalism can be real if it's paired with smart, good government, and we can use that for good, just like other countries that are economically free are starting to do, and we just need to ramp it up and scale it uh, with a good balance. Julian, would you care to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the central problem it, that, that we face is that um, there are certainly some young conservatives who, uh, you know, believe that climate change is real and, and um, you know, want to take a uh, sort of more towards the free market end, but a mixed, you know, sort of economy approach to tackle uh, climate change. The problem is that their party doesn't listen to them or care about what they think. Uh, you know, the last president described uh, climate change as a quote unquote hoax invented by the Chinese. And that is a lot far cry from um, you know, a party that can uh, say that it's interested in, in, in tackling uh, global warming. You know, the first uh, Bush president, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, just said that he wanted to take on the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. But in the intervening 30 years, uh, the Republican party has even overshot uh, the fossil fuel corporations and their support for, for climate denial. Um, and, you know, there's a very specific history that, that's behind that. You know, ExxonMobil had models that showed climate change uh, was real, that it was happening. They were actually surprisingly accurate models uh, that predicted we would be at about one degree uh, Celsius of warming above pre-industrial levels right now, which is about where we're at. Uh, and they even, you know, used those models to raise the drilling rigs uh, on their sort of ocean drilling operations, uh, you know, by a number of meters to predict sea level rise. And they then, you know, took that knowledge and they, they went and financed a, a very concerted campaign and effort to um, deny and, and uh, you know, sort of stir up um, controversy around the notion that climate change was real. And unfortunately, um, you know, the Republican Party does not tend to listen to sort of conservative activists who believe in and want to see action on climate change. It tends to still be dominated by uh, a belief that climate change is not real. In fact, actually, just two days ago, uh, a Gallup poll showed that 88% of Democrats say that climate change is real and is caused by uh, human activities, and just 32% of Republicans say the same. And that is actually the lowest um, level of Republican belief in climate change uh, being anthropogenically caused uh, that has ever been measured. Uh, this issue has never been more polarized. 
And so I think the problem is that like, not that there aren't good people like Benji out there who, um, you know, want to see their party, uh, the Republican party take action on this issue. It's just that the party is not listening to those people. Julian, thank you very much. And you could not have set us up better to move to the larger discussion. So could we bring in please uh, Francis and Noel? And, you know, Julian has really put on the table for us the question of how we make progress against these issues. How, how do we do that? Given that, whether you believe in, you know, believe as if it was a religious faith, whether you believe in climate change, anthropogenic climate change or not, has become a, a badge of identity. And when something becomes a badge of identity, it can be super hard to dislodge. Um, and we have deep partisan divide. How, in a moment, I'm going to ask the panel, how do we move forward in the face of this seemingly untractable divide? And um, I welcome anyone who wants to jump in on that from the panel. But let me make a note to the audience. If you have questions for the panel, please enter them into the Q&A. We've already got a bunch of cool questions. Um, so I will begin to, uh, I will begin to, um, to introduce those questions. Well, and if, if I could just jump in to respond to what Julian said, uh, because I think it was, and I'm sure Ambassador Rooney has, has a lot of uh, feedback as well from, from his time in Congress. Look, the, the, the recent Gallup poll is incredibly disheartening, and it's something that is very frustrating for our organization. But there is a generational divide, and you made that clear uh, in your comments, Julian. I mean, over 90% of young conservatives that we've polled, as well as polls from Gallup and others, show that that's an important climate change is an important issue for them, and that they want their leaders to take it seriously. Uh, but I also think there's just an incredible partisan divide in this country where. When Republicans think of climate change, they think of liberals and liberal solutions. And there was a study back in 2014 that showed that 36% of Republicans believed in climate change. But when they were prevent when they were presented with a market-minded solution, that jumped to 70%. It almost doubled. So the point is a lot of conservatives are not believing in climate change because they feel like the solutions don't fit within their value sets. So how do we get past that? How do they, how do we get so that elected officials actually listen to people like Ambassador Rooney and myself? Well, I think it's already starting to happen. And I know that's also maybe an unpopular opinion, but next week, uh, the leader of the House GOP, uh, Kevin McCarthy, disagree with him on a lot of things. He will be in introducing his own climate package of bipartisan bills. Now, it's not enough, it's not going to solve the crisis, but the fact that the leader of the House GOP is starting to introduce the policies is, is a perfect showcase of how the pressure is starting to get to him from organizations like ours and that he's responding. There are dozens of other conservatives that are on board with climate change policies more than ever before. Uh, you know, Ambassador Rooney and I share a lot of mutual friends. We have a lot of incredible allies in the House and the Senate that are starting to lean more into this. It's nowhere near where it needs to be. But the, the biggest failure of, of this conversation would be that this is going to be a liberal only issue. We will not solve it by just having liberals at the table. We will not solve it by waiting every flip-flopping four years until the right president is elected or the right house in the Senate is, is in control. We need more conservatives standing up than ever before, but we need to make it apparent to them that it can fit within their values, that it will matter to their local communities, and that, can, that fighting climate change can actually be a positive thing if we look at it the right way and we have their voice in this conversation. So. I, I definitely agree with you. The frustration is real. That's why my activism exists. That's why Ambassador Rooney's on this uh, call as well. We're, we're two of the few, uh, but uh, there will there will be more of us, and there have to be more of us. That well, if I might make a point or two, of course. <clears throat> if you have time. I mean, yeah, Julian, I've got the tire tracks across my back, having fought the fight you're talking about with conservatives, and uh, it's very difficult to argue with someone who doesn't have to be accountable for what they say or do. And that's where we get into this uh, ideology versus facts. And we're fighting a battle to convince people about the facts so that they can bring pressure on the people that just wanna deal with an ideology. That's your hoaxers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think that, that we can win the game. And, 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 and to what uh, Benji said, 
we're making a little headway. Uh, I, I carpet bombed Kevin McCarthy. We're very close uh, with facts, with polling data of young people, of suburban people, et cetera. And he gets it intellectually. He's not ready to get out in front of his skis with his conference, but he's nudging them a little bit. You got a guy from Arkansas named Brad Wenstrup who introduced a bill to plant 50,000 trees, okay? It's not a huge deal. It's like one acre of the Everglades or the uh, Amazon, but it's better than nothing. And, and we had several people uh, like Fred Upton who retired and uh, or Greg Walden who didn't, who retired, Fred Upton who hasn't retired, who are kind of borderline interested in talking about climate and a guy from Utah uh, that's interested in it, but they're scared of the right wing beating them up. And that's where we have to be there to protect them and nudge them along. And the people need to push the politicians. That's where I get back to let the people know how they're going to get affected by sea level rise, acidification, uh, ocean heat content, uh, the risks to the world of Central Africa not having any food. What's going to happen then? You know, there's all kinds of big things out there that that we need to make the world that, that the American conservatives need to understand where they, they can't just ignore it. So, so I'm a Harvard professor and I, I really resonate with what you're saying, um, Francis and Benji, but you know, many people say, wait, 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 climate change, the science isn't, isn't fi fi uh, fixed. Uh, we have a question in the Q and A, you know, how come you guys went right to assuming that climate change is real and that it's going to have bad effects? May I ask, um, those on the panelists who care to chip in, you know, what do you say when you, you are faced with someone who says, you know, look, guys, you've just drunk far too much Kool-Aid. Um, no, that no, well, the Himalayas. Coming... You've never been able to see the Himalayas and uh, back last summer you could. <laughs> no, Noel, would you feel comfortable jumping in on this? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'm not the scientist you want answering on the science of it, but what I'll say is that, um, it comes down to when you're speaking to someone where it's an ideological thing or it's like a tribal thing and this is a belief, I think it, it gets really hard because you can show them the data. You know, there's people that say, well, the the there's sun phases or it's gas from volcanoes or or whatever it is. And there's actually data out there. I've, I've seen these plots that say that those difference differences are nothing compared to what humans are doing. You can see the Mauna Loa data showing the CO2 going up, right? But at the end of the day, I don't think showing data is working. We've tried that um, and we can continue trying that. What I've been hearing, and again, this comes back to my, my uh, communication education. I want to hear from some, some more of those um, societal people experts, behavioral experts, the communication specialists on this. But what I've heard is that um, talking person to person. So uh, someone, who you know, talking to your own family, if you have climate deniers in your family, starting there, because it, it has to be person to person, has to be someone they trust, using the, the stories, the anecdotes, uh, like Francis just mentioned, something I use all the time is I show pictures from my hotel room in China, where you literally can't see across the river, because mm -hmm. the particulates in the air are so bad, um, you had to wear a mask, you could smell it, it was just horrible, um, so, so some of those, like, uh, uh, gut-wrenching gut things that, that actually happen to people. And then the other piece of this that sometimes works is thinking about national security. We have a huge national security um, uh, support behind, yeah, climate change is real. It's already impacting our bases and our operations, and we have to do something about it. Um, it was, let's see, the National Intelligence Council puts out a global trends report every four years, and it, I think it just came out again, and it just spotlighted climate change Yesterday. as... One of, yeah, yeah, thank you, Francis. Uh, one of the scariest things that we need to think about, it's gonna be basically encouraging uh, global, global migrations and um, incenting uh, just violence in, in areas where people aren't used to living together and there's no water left. And it's just gonna be very scary. And I think is, could possibly cause world wars. Uh, so that, that's, that's one thing to help um, maybe show the broader impacts of what this is. It's not just, you know, two inches rise or, or whatever on someone's back porch, but, but something bigger. Thank you. Yeah, I think all these people should watch the movie Interstellar. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll chat, we'll, uh, we'll make sure it's on the website. Thank you. I mean, for what it's worth, I, I get this question a lot from business people. And um, I say two things. I say, 
my best understanding is that the scientific consensus is very strong. The research has been peer reviewed. When I talk to my colleagues on the other side of the river, they show me the science and I find it very convincing. But suppose you don't. How much are you willing to gamble that the scientists are wrong? If we just think of it as a risk calculation, I mean, maybe you're not completely convinced by the science. Maybe it's only 50-50 that something is happening. Maybe only a 25% chance that the very negative kinds of consequences that are in that report that came out just yesterday are going to happen. That's a big number. I mean, 25% odds of seriously destabilizing the world's economy. It, might you not want to pay attention to it? So I, I, I use a risk framing, but you know, I think this is an issue we're all grappling with. Can I ask another question? Um, and this is from Siran Hayes. And um, Kiran, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, they say the agency of government closest to people is local government. And now I'm paraphrasing. We've been talking about federal government, even global government. Does local government have an important role to play here? And if so, what, what is it? Can I make a comment on that? Of course. Well, you know, we're seeing that in many places. Again, it's one of these other instances where the people are outrunning the politicians and finding solutions to their problems, just like the military is that you just mentioned. Uh, Miami Beach had the first chief resilience officer and they're putting in place measures to deal with sea level rise. State of Florida has its first chief resiliency officer. We have resiliency uh, uh, community groups in two of them in the district I represented and all over Florida, because we're kind of ground zero for all this stuff. Stronger storms, sea level rise, acid uh, in the water and coral bleaching, whatever bad's gonna happen out of climate change, Florida's gonna be ground zero. And so we, we're seeing a lot of community activism and, and I think that we could see more of it around the country if we can get the word out. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think going back to that road trip I took, I think one of the things that was very apparent was that that local action can happen a lot quicker. And you know, we all know here that this is a global problem, that this is something that needs substantial change, societal change, cultural changes, so many different economic changes. But if you, can't have the buy-in from the local level, none of that, none of the rest of it matters because you need to have local individuals, local elected officials being able to implement those things. And if you think about Congress, there's nothing that moves more slowly than Congress, right? There's nothing that moves more slowly than Nancy Pelosi and and Dan Crenshaw trying to agree on something. You know, it's <laughs> it's 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 really, you know, an opportunity for us to say, okay, let's let them do what they need to do at the national level, come up with some solutions, but at the same time, let's make sure that at the local level we're implementing things as well because also local areas understand their environment better than anyone else. They know what energy sources are realistic. They know what different programs are realistic in terms of those natural solutions that I was alluding to earlier. And a lot of times those local areas can make better decisions than the federal government can. So I think, again, going back to a point I was making earlier, we need to, a better balance in this conversation. It can't just to be about federal government or, or bust. It has to be all levels of government uh, playing a, a big role in this. And as climate activists and as people who care, the best way to get more people to buy in, people who are skeptical, is to have more local uh, opportunities for action because it makes it more at home and it allows people to be involved and it can happen much more quickly. Julian, what's your take on the conversation? I just don't think that it's a controversial notion that we should have good local government that cares about climate active action. I think the bigger question is why politics is becoming increasingly national and why people increasingly cannot name who their local elected representatives are and what the you know issues of the day are um, at a local level. I think that's more core to the, the issue in the question. Um, you know, I think that one of the big problems that we face is that in cities, towns, and communities across this country, um, there is no newspaper really, or barely a newspaper left that can tell people what's going on at their, you know, local city hall where they can even, you know, plug into what the sort of political policy questions are of the day. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with the notion that um, we also need local and state and tribal governments taking action on, on climate change. I think that that's not a controversial idea or statement. And, you know, certainly uh, the federal, it's not a federal versus 
uh, only state and local question. I think that that's like kind of a, a straw man debate. Um, you know, again, I think the question is what 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 the what the policies are at the local level that that should be implemented, what they are at the state level, what they are at the federal and tribal levels, um, and also how do we. Uh, in an era where it's increasingly difficult, as I was saying, to get information about what's happening, you know, not in DC in politics, um, how do we keep people informed so that they're engaging in ways that are, you know, sort of small d democratic? And I think part of all of this is the timing. I'll just say again, and I'll 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 give you an example or a, like a, like a metaphor. When I was in grad school, I would have a paper due, like a twenty-page paper due at the end of the week, and I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to knock out four pages a day. And of course, I wouldn't end up doing it until Thursday, but by then you've got to write 20 pages in one night. We don't have time to wait. We have to start doing things now. So we've been waiting and, and not a lot has been happening. So I think uh, thinking about the timing and what we need to put in place now so that we are not having as hard a time in a few years is going to be helpful. Yeah, I think the military is a bit of a, an analogy on to that point. I mean, they're, they're just moving forward, taking care of their bases, raising up their airfields, putting in uh, berms and things to protect against sea level rise. They, they've got a job to do, and they're not waiting for anybody to tell them to do it or not do it. So, and again, I'm, I'm trying to push the whole panel a little, um, because that's what we're trying to model, right, is walking out into difficult questions and, and seeing how we can do on that. Um, if we're seeing less and less engagement at the local level. And if the federal level, you know, we'd love to see it, but we, we don't see much of it. If federal politics is really key, um, how important is it to, and I'm feeling my nervousness in asking this question, how important is it to revisit how we think about politics and particularly about elections? Is that a climate issue? I mean, people make the argument that we have one party which is very opposed to, mostly very opposed to action on climate change, which is in some measures a minority party. If you look at it, the 50 Democratic senators represent 50 million more people than the 50 Republican senators. And uh, we sometimes say the recent election was close, but it wasn't that close because there were 7 billion more votes for President Biden than for President Trump. And so is the move to sort of really focus on our elections and to make sure that everybody's included, um, is that an important part of this solution? Or is you that really- You let me make a solution? comment about that, having had my neck in the noose for four or five years. <laughs> uh, I think you make a very interesting point. And the, unfortunately, so much of the energy about election uh, activity right now has gone into these kind of how much early voting do you get, how many drop boxes, et cetera. And there's reasonable people can differ about all that. I don't think, don't think very many people would differ about the goal of letting make sure everybody gets to vote. But the, uh, if I could be czar long enough to do the carbon tax and deal with Brazil, just have about five more minutes as are, I would uh, uh, redistrict all of Congress to make sure that we return to partisan district, nonpartisan districts. R plus two, D plus two. If, if you go back and look, under as late as Bill Clinton's second term, 25% of the Congress were considered highly partisan districts. Now it's over 80. So th the election doesn't matter, it's only the primaries. And that's not right. And that creates that sclerosis that you're talking about. So if we could fix that, we'd go a long way towards having a real contest of ideas. And the other thing I would do is I would go for term limits and make sure that there's plenty of turnover. And uh, the, the founders never intended a political class and I don't think it's really serving us so well right now of either party, quite frankly. So I'm gonna- The third in. thing I would do, if I could say one more thing, I would put the fairness doctrine back in. Roger Ailes got Reagan to take the fairness doctrine out. I would put the fairness doctrine in that when one party makes a political a position, they have to give the other side. Those three things would help a lot, I think. Okay. You're a hard man to disagree with, Ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Rooney. No. Let me try something else that I think might, it, no, Noel, forgive me. Do you want to jump in? 
Oh, I was just going to mention, you know, when you first mentioned that, my first thought went to when I was working in government, I finally fully realized the importance of balance of powers. And so we don't want to, we don't want to get rid of that. We want to make sure there's checks and balances, there's um, that going on. And of course, that makes things harder. Uh, but that that maintains our democracy. At the same time, when there's a <laughs> national security issue or like COVID is going on right now, are we really pulling the public to say this is what we should do in COVID? No. Um, the government is putting policies in place. That's what they did with the Manhattan Project, et cetera. So term limits, like Francis mentioned, is the, the, the balance there. People don't like it. If they're not seeing the results, they're going to vote someone out. But I'm hoping that the leaders would be doing the right thing um, while, they're in, while they're in power. Super. Let, let me try something else, which I hope will be controversial and is based on a couple of questions from our, from, uh, from our um, audience. The real problem is economic growth. We're consuming too much. What we need to address climate change is restrict consumption. All we think about are things, things, things. Here I'm paraphrasing, but, and it's all our stuff that is the problem. What we need to do is really focus on consumption. What, uh, what does the panel think? Well, I'll, I'll just throw in that if you look at our basic needs, water, energy, food are the three that come to mind for me. Um, there's a lot embedded just in that. It's not just the iPhones that we're buying, et cetera. That's important too. On top of that, we have population growth. We have the world moving towards um, higher income, which is fantastic. People are able to afford more, eat more, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I, I want to look at the data, but to me, I don't know if this all goes away if we consume less. And on top of that, we could be thinking about circular economy, recycling things, hopefully that allows us to maintain, you know, the happiness, the, the fun parts of life, um, uh, but, but, but maintain, uh, you know, global temperatures at a, a temperature we need to. Yeah, and I think it's, it's figuring out how to consume more efficiently. Uh, you know, it's figuring out how we can eat, how we can drive, how we can do everything that we do more efficiently. And that's, I think, what the power of technology is in this, which I think the four of us all agree on. I think one of the problems that makes people skeptical of climate change and, and being involved, even on the left of center, is being told what to do. People don't want to be told to consume less or to completely change their lives, especially if that's the last thing they're worried about in their day-to-day -day lives. They're worried about putting food on their tables. They're not worried about whether they're eating the right food or, or driving the right car. And so I think we have to make it easier for people to be more efficient, but not tell them to, uh, to consume less. And I also think as a first world country, like the United States is, is a developed country. We don't have the right to tell other countries that they they can't be developed because that that would mean that their consumption levels would go up. Uh, I think everyone should have the same opportunities to to have uh, economic success if they want it. Um, and and as 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 a person who feels like that has been a privilege and that growing up in the United States has been a privilege. I think that that's something that we should not be imposing on, on other countries. I'm not saying that's what the, the question was asking, but a lot of times that is what it comes down to. So I think twofold. One, we should make sure that we, should, that we can make consumption more efficient for everyone. And two, how can we make that consumption efficiency true across all cultures and all levels for those in other countries and other places that want to, to be um, you know, similar economically? Yeah. Wow. You know uh, yeah. That's a good, good point. several good points made here. Um, that keeps, I keep th thinking of single use plastics here. And most of the, the environmental degradation of single use plastics comes from Asia. So we can do a lot of things in the United States to be a lot cleaner and have a lot less plastic lying around, but ultimately we're going to need a UN global treaty or something to deal with like that uh, island of plastics out there west of the Galapagos, which is bigger than the state of Texas. That's a huge problem and it's growing all the time. You know, you think back to the 1950s, you got your milk in a bottle and you took the bottle out and put it on your front door and the milkman brought you a new one. Now you get it in a plastic thing. Um, when you went to a hamburger place, you got it wrapped up in a piece of paper, not one of John Huntsman's polystyrene uh, packages. There's a lot of things that we could do and government could set the bar with deposits like California has and things like that 
to, to mandate better packaging and more, as Benji says, efficient use of uh, the packaging of consumer goods. That, that's so important to remember, thank you. Um, you and uh, Benji have both set up the next question I want to ask, and this is from uh, Colin, this is from Colin Chen. And he wants us to talk about the international dimensions of these problems. Now, as I'm sure everyone on the panelists knows and many of our listeners, we could zero out emissions in the US. And if emissions continue to increase at current rates in places like India and China, and we hope Africa will start really accelerating their development soon, we'll see enormous emissions there. To what extent do you think, and Julian, I'm hoping you will take this question first, to what extent do you think that the developed countries and the US in particular, who put up into the atmosphere such a large fraction of the CO2 that's there, to what extent do the developed nations have a responsibility to transfer resources to less developed countries to help them transition? And if so, about how much and how would you handle that politically? Julian, would you take a shot at that? Yeah, so as a progressive, I believe strongly that the uh, those who have uh, and who um, have prospered, you know, need to pay back to society and in this instance, global society, um, what they're owed. You know, one of the deepest uh, injustices of climate change is the fact that uh, many of the nations and people who have contributed the least to the problem, you know, think about the Marshall Islands, for example, which is going to cease to exist uh, this century, um, you know, are, are some of the most uh, heavily impacted. And I think that that's, true domestically uh, for communities that have uh, borne the brunt of fossil fuel capitalism. Uh, and it's also true globally. So I do think that uh, the global north and powerful nations uh, that have you know, contributed historically the most to global emissions like the United States, uh, as well as rising powers like China, um, who are going to contribute um, you know, many, <laughs> a great deal of emissions to uh, the atmosphere moving forward. Uh, you know, do have a responsibility to uh, the global south and to to countries who, um, you know, are trying to achieve the sorts of prosperity that we have here uh, and are now going to be, you know, sort of developing uh, in an era where we also need to be decoupling that development and growth um, from emissions and, and carbon pollution. So I 100% uh, agree and believe in that. Uh, but I think that, you know, convincing um, voters domestically, particularly on sort of the conservative side of the aisle, uh, that we do owe something to the rest of the world on this issue is, is going to be the real challenge. Any thoughts from other members of the panel on this? I actually, I'd actually strongly agree uh, with Julian uh, for a couple of reasons. First, absolutely, we need global buy-in, uh, but there is no excuse that the United States should be making to say, oh, other countries are increasing their emissions, therefore we shouldn't do anything. That's that's the worst. That's the worst excuse that we could give. You know, if you apply that to any other global crisis, you know, other countries are doing it worse, so we're going to continue doing it ourselves is a terrible excuse. Uh, so I think as a country, we have an obligation to not only handle the emissions that we currently uh, emit, but as well as take into consideration the effects of what we have done in the past. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if I would agree, like it would depend on what the policy would look like, but I don't know if we should necessarily work on trying to repay the past. But I think in terms of the, the present, a lot of the straw man arguments that are made are, oh, well, China and India emit more than the United States, therefore what we do, what we do doesn't matter. And that's just not true uh, at all. And I think we need global buy-in, but we also need the conservative and independent uh, skeptics in this country to, to be on board with the United States trying to lead as well. The way I see it is that really there's no borders when it comes to water. There's no borders exactly. when it comes to air. It's like if your roommate's bed was on fire, would you just ignore it? No, you're going to be in trouble pretty soon too. It's, this is a global thing. I started my uh, my career in aerospace and so big fan of all the, the moon shots and everything. And I always think back to that pale blue dot photo and we're all in it together and, and we need to be thinking that way. You know, Marcus, to, I'm to, going to give you the last word here. So <laughs> well, to look at the, 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 the metrics of the uh, Paris Accord, you know, voluntary, voluntary reductions and, and, and goals. 
I agree with Benji. I think we should be the first mover. We should set the example, not not say India is doing it, so we can't do anything. We should say we're going to do better, and then use that moral clout to work with other nations to drive them to do better. I mean, China's got some pretty ambitious electric car goals, and we should be hoping they can accomplish those. Uh, and they still burn a whole lot of coal from the Alsace region across a region across to Russia that we should deal with uh, Europe about. And honestly, the economic opportunities are going to be huge. I mean, other countries are already making money off of this. Solar, EV, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have battery manufacturing here in the US. It's all you know, licensed from, from Asia. So I think it's a lost opportunity if we're not jumping in as well. Absolutely. On that cheerful note, I would like to thank the panelists enormously. Thank you very much. Thank you for so generously giving us your time and your commitment and your ideas. I think we succeeded. We had a conversation about climate change in which there was at least some disagreement and it was civic. But Ninha, I'll be curious what you think. Great, first of all, thank you again, um, Francis, uh, Noel, Benji, and Julian, and, and Rebecca for moderating that discussion. And I think <clears throat> uh, what I take away from, from hearing the conversation is how difficult it is to separate for people, um, I guess what people are calling sort of fact or fact-based arguments and um, values and ideology, right? Uh, and, and I think that's, that's the part that I think makes this in some sense a very difficult uh, conversation. And so, as we go forward, um, one thing I hope that comes out of this discussion is to help be more explicit about those two. I think that that for me is sort of what I what I hear in the discussion. I clearly the there was actually not as much disagreement among many of you with regards to the issues, but if we think about the broader spectrum within which this conversation is happening, uh, that really seems to be um, at the heart of the issue. And how to address that strikes me as as a big challenge. And going forward, I really um, uh, I'm grateful uh, for all of you to help sort of show us how to do that. There are still positions open if you are an undergraduate interested in joining um, and continuing this conversation uh, and peer-led conversation among your, your peers on this issue. And if you'd like to do so, I think Emily has put into the chatter email and you should email her to register for, um, for that conversation. Uh, because this issue of thinking about facts and values is clearly not just part of the climate change debate, but it's part of all of many, many other difficult debates. And so thank you again to our panelists and to Rebecca for helping us to sort of work through that in the context of the issue of how to address climate change. And I hope that for all the panelists, uh, the attendees listening, um, this will be an important inspiration for you to think about how to have these conversations with your peers going forward, not just on the issue of climate change, but, but also many of the other controversial issues um, that we face today uh, that are challenging for all of us. So please join me in thanking our panelists and Rebecca, and um, thank you very much for, uh, for this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you.